Hi, everyone. I am, once again, Professor John Kirkland. Today's lecture uh, is focused on the book uh, written by Friedrich Nietzsche entitled Die Freude Wissenschaft, uh, translated into English mostly uh, as the gay science or the joyful science. So <clears throat> uh, Nietzsche's book uh, was published originally in 1882. In 1887, however, he published a second expanded edition, um, and there he added the fifth part of the book along with a, pre uh, a uh, preface and uh, a, um, a, an appendix entitled The Songs of Prince Vogelfrei, literally the song of, uh, songs of Prince Freebird. Um, the Gay Science is the last of what Nietzsche refers to as his free spirit books. So along with Human All to Human and Daybreak, um, and all three of them uh, are written therefore in his characteristic aphoristic style. And they share a kind of buoyant and optimistic mood, we can say. Uh, indeed, in his uh, retrospective account of all uh, his works in Ecce Homo, Nietzsche describe, describes the gay science as, like Daybreak, quote, an affirmative book, uh, deep but bright and good-natured. He writes that uh, in almost every sentence, profundity gently joins hands with headstrong passion. So this is uh, something we want to give a little bit of thought to. That is, um, it's this capacity to undertake the most serious and existentially freighted thought experiments, but doing so in a cheerful, uh, joyous uh, mode that Nietzsche associates in Ecce Homo with, um, uh, with these books. And uh, he specifically associates that project um, in Ecce Homo with the uh, Provencal troubadours of the High Middle Ages. Um, the Provencal name then for the art of poetry that the troubadours practiced was La Gaia Schienza. Uh, so we want to go into the gay science uh, uh, imagining that Nietzsche is presenting uh, his philosophical project here as akin to that, um, that art of poetry specifically. And indeed, uh, the gay science bears an epigraph uh, which reads, um, uh, in Adrian Del Carlo's translation, and here I'll share my screen with you. Just to, uh, you see it. Um, the epigraph reads, this house is my own and here I dwell. I've never aped nothing from no one and laugh at each master, mark me well, who at himself has not poked fun. And then with the directive over my front door. So, it seems that we're to imagine here uh, this sentiment that is hanging over the, the threshold of, of Nietzsche's home or of the home, the book, uh, uh, wherein the spirit of the book dwells, right? We, as we enter this space, this is the, the directive we receive. Um, so the spirit of the book then announces itself as um, an original, right? Uh, uh, not aping other thinkers or other philosophers. Um, and also as mocking anyone who takes themselves too seriously. And so here I'd like to suggest as we move into the book, um, we might ask what precisely does it mean that Nietzsche seems to be requiring us to be able to poke fun at ourselves, to not take ourselves too seriously, philosophically? So what does it mean to undertake philosophy in a way that's not too serious? What all is entailed there? Or what all is entailed philosophically in the project of um, philosophizing and poking fun at oneself simultaneously in doing so? How, how do we carry forward that specific project, right? Um, and speaking of the front door, I, I heard the doorbell. Sorry, I'll be right, you know, just pause and all. Okay. Wait a second. That's not. Okay. Hello. 
Ich bin's. Ja, der entkörperte Schnurrbart Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, how would you say in English? Uh, vielleicht uh, something like uh, the bodiless mustache of Friedrich Nietzsche? So I've come down here all the way from uh, Himmel der, der Schnurrbarten. Uh, what do you call this place in English? The heaven of mustaches, I suppose. And I've come to tell you that I've been watching you and your class all quarter. And I have just been really impressed with the niveau of the discussion, the seriousness and the rigor you have been bringing to the thought of good old Fritz. It's all the more remarkable as the world around us seems to be falling apart, coming apart at the seams that you have continued to discuss with such seriousness and commitment the thought of Nietzsche. It's fabelhaft. And you can take, you can really trust my judgment here as to the quality of your discussions and your insights. Because you know, I know what I'm talking about here, right? I was right there at the source, or yeah, I'm just, just hanging there above the source. And anyway, so you can really trust my, my judgment of your work so far. As you must imagine, you know, Nietzsche, as he wrote everything, yeah, alles from Geburt der Tragedie all the way to those, those last weird postcards he sent from Turin. As he wrote, he always muttered everything he wrote, constantly muttering, muttering. So I can really say, that everything that Nietzsche ever said or wrote came right through me. Yeah, I am like, uh, I'm, I'm practically full with the crumbs and, and dribblings of Nietzsche's Gedanken. I am like a plump philosophical dumpling, really. And in, in, in fact, yeah, yeah, let's do this. Ask me anything, anything at all, yeah? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? Hmm, moment. I feel like you are even more advanced in your study of Nietzsche than I had imagined. It seems that you know that what lies beyond appearance what we would most want to ask after. This is for Nietzsche always unknowable, always unsayable. This pulsing, riling, unfathomable ground of existence. And so you pose your question in silence. But then you must also know that I must answer also in silence. We speak zusammen here, die Sprache der Stille. Yeah, the language of silence. But take care here, my man, children, because this way lies madness. Or that way. Or whichever way, you know, whichever way die Sprache der Stille takes you, that way, that's what, that's what I mean. That way lies madness. Okay, well, I got to make like a banana and split. But before I go, I would like to just tell you not to take old Herr Professor Lerkop there too seriously. He's still standing down there at the front door after I made the doorbell ring. Yeah, his scholarly pretensions, you know, Nietzschean thought is not really at home in the library. It's not for the scholars. It lives in the streets in the desert, on the wild sea. It is, or perhaps it lives even when staying very much at home. In any case, it is for living. It is for living itself. Indeed, I'm reminded here of a saying from one of your great American uh, writers, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, he says, there are nowadays professors of philosophy, aber kein Philosophen, 
<laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, I only know this quote in Germanish. Okay, well, on that note, before the, uh, the professor comes uh, I'll, I'll be off as a bish beta. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, hit me up on Instagram. Uh, my handle is the der entkörperte Schnurrbart odds. Okay, tschüss. No one there. I think I might have left the computer on. I left the taping going. Well, uh, I have to remember to hold on. Let me just remember to edit out the pause. Remember to edit. If I really set it in my memory, I'll always remember to do it. Okay. So, where are we? Okay, so the preface. Um, so even before the, uh, the sort of cleansing rinse that we get as we pass through the really light and irreverent and almost kind of silly poems um, that precede the book. Even before that, uh, we're faced with the 1887 preface that Nietzsche wrote. And this is an especially fascinating um, preface among those that Nietzsche uh, uh, retrospectively uh, uh, appended to his text along with the four that he wrote in 1886, of course. Um, because in this preface, Nietzsche tells us what the preface is supposed to be accomplishing and maybe indeed what all prefaces uh, in his mind are supposed to accomplish. So here he writes um, in the very opening paragraph, right, or very opening lines, this book might need more than one preface. And in the end, there would still be room for doubting whether someone who has not experienced something similar could, by means of prefaces, be brought closer to the experiences of this book. So setting aside the potentially absolute incommunicability of these experiences, um, we understand here that prefaces are generally intended to bring the reader closer to the experiences out of which arose the concepts, the arguments, the insights of the book. The preface should move us toward or even into that experiential register so that then uh, we might be able to think out of it along with the author. We might be able to think the concepts and the arguments and the insights of the book as emerging out of, and therefore as leaving behind, uh, as inevitably failing to capture entirely the experiences out of which those concepts and arguments and insights emerge. And only then do we sort of handle or understand these concepts and arguments and insights properly. So only this way then would we be able to be thinking along with Nietzsche in the, the text of the gay science, it seems. And so then we ask, right, what, what, what is that particular experience that, that out of which the gay science arises? And Nietzsche tells us uh, on the first page that it is the intoxication of recovery. So let's try to think a little bit about what is this uh, intoxication precisely? How do we come to know in the experience, or what is it that we come to know in the experience of recovery precisely? And then, just... so Nietzsche tells us quite directly what it is that's revealed in the experience of recovery, or what we come to know in the experience of recovery. Let's uh, just check out that passage. I'll share my. Yeah, this must be it. Okay. Um, so here, Nietzsche says uh, right, that uh, in the experience of recovery, that is in emerging from sickness, what we acquire is, quote, an, a, a reawakened faith in tomorrow and in a day after tomorrow of a sudden sense and anticipation of a future 
of impending adventures, of reopened seas, of goals that are permitted and believed in again. So it seems that what we become in the process of becoming healthy again, in, in returning to health specifically, we become more aware of the future in our actions and our thought. Our thought opens itself up. Our actions, our conduct in the world open, its, open themselves up to the future. They're no longer obsessively and exclusively focused on the past and what Nietzsche would think of generally as vengeance, right? Revenge upon past misdeeds or shortcomings or failures, etc nor in the frantic sort of demands of the present, in the process of recovery, we begin to feel the need to take into account, to, to do justice to the future. And I would submit here, qua future. That is, looking at the, the ways in which Nietzsche evokes the future, right? The impending adventures or reopened seas, that is, an indeterminate and unpredictable future specifically. That's the future that we have to, that we become more aware of and that we, we incorporate into ourselves and our actions and our thinking as we convalesce. As we return to health, the future opens up and, and begins to have an effect on us. An unsettling effect indeed, an effect that provokes, as we saw in Zarathustra, an overcoming, a self-overcoming. So rather than being consumed by the past or the present, we open ourselves up to the future as a convalescing. And here we have, in, in this thinking about this, uh, this description of convalescence, the experience of convalescence, what we come to realize is something about health and sickness for Nietzsche. That is, health is a certain temporality for Nietzsche. Health is a way of being and acting and thinking toward an open and indeterminate future. That is what amounts to health. And being incapable of that, being incapable of opening up to that unanticipatable open future, that, that undetermined future, that is what Nietzsche calls sickness. That's, that's the temporality of sickness. And so we've come finally, after a long discussion of various aspects of health and convalescence, or sickness and convalescence, to, to a kind of notion of what Nietzsche's idea of health is for us. And this becomes then especially important because Nietzsche goes on then in, on pages four and five to talk about um, the history of philosophy and in a sense to, right, to divide up all the thinkers uh, um, in the philosophical tradition into two camps. So, right, he says here, well, let us leave Mr. Nietzsche. What is it to us that Mr. Nietzsche has got well again? Um, and he says here, well, assuming that one is a person, <laughs> one necessarily also has the philosophy of that person. But here is a considerable difference, right? So he's saying, remember that notion of personality that we found in the philosophy of the tragic age of the Greeks. Assuming one is a person, which is not a discrete atomistic subject uh, set over against the world and separated off with, uh, from reality and from others. It's actually a permeable uh, point of contact with nature. That's what Nietzsche calls personality. So assuming one is that person, the philosophy, remember he says, the philosophy is like a plant that grows out of that, that ground, that kind of unfathomable ground. Um, and he's sort of returning to the same idea of philosophy here. A philosophy always ref sort of is of its ground. It emerges out of that ground. Um, but there's a very big difference about how that philosophy is produced. That is, in some, it is their weaknesses that philosophize. In others, their riches and their strength. The former need their philosophy as a prop, a sedative, a medicine, redemption, elevation, self-alienation. For the latter, it is only a beautiful luxury. In the best case, the voluptuousness of a triumphant gratitude that eventually has to inscribe itself in cosmic letters on the heaven of concepts. So this is a really fundamental distinction that we should try to take very seriously in Nietzsche, that 
when he hears philosophy happening, philosophy can either be motivated by the weaknesses of the human condition, its failings, its incapacities, or it can be a reflection and a, and a, and a further unfolding of the strengths of the human condition. And different philosophers philosophize from their weaknesses or their strengths. And he's suggesting philosophies of weakness are harmful to human life. And philosophies of strength are helpful, supportive, they're provocative, and they're, they're, they're strengthening. They help you to begin to, to philosophy. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so let's go on to kind of trace out this quote here. Um, Nietzsche says then, right, uh, <clears throat> on page five, he says, uh, <clears throat> right, um, <clears throat> He says, so what will become the thought that is subjected to the pressure of illness? What happens when, when illness arises <clears throat> and one feels sick? I think we can all relate to this now, right? The pressure that is imposed on thinking, what happens? <clears throat> and Nietzsche says, this is the question that concerns the psychologist. And here an experiment is possible. So here Nietzsche, remember we've heard Nietzsche characterize his project as philosophy, as philology, as a kind of science, as a kind of poetry, as a kind of art, and now as a kind of psychology, a digging down into the psyche that produces philosophy. That's the project he sees himself as undertaking. And he says, here's, a, here's an experiment. <clears throat> Just like the traveler who resolves to wake up at a certain hour and then calmly gives himself up to sleep, we two philosophers, should we become ill, temporarily surrender with body and soul to the illness. We shut our eyes to ourselves, as it were. Okay, so this is really fundamental for Nietzsche. A philosophy is suspect, is unhealthy, is worthy of criticism when it shuts its eyes to the philosopher themselves. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean, well, you should be attending to all of your subjective characteristics and all the features of your ego and what makes you a unique person. It means that you need to be attending to that subconscious welling up of drives and forces and be aware of it and understand your philosophy as emerging out of it and then seize hold of that movement and that energy and use it to create philosophical concepts. Don't shut your eyes to yourself. That is that underlying um, play, that complex of drives and forces that actually goes well beyond you and permeates you uh, to produce this philosophical uh, product. Um, <clears throat> then he says, right, uh, a little bit further down on the page here, he kind of gives us a little bit more of an explanation of this kind of philosophizing, right? He says, after such self-questioning, self-temptation, one acquires, so this is how we would philosophize if once we've sort of arrived out of this, or emerged out of this sickness and, and, and subjected ourselves to a kind of scrutiny. He says, um, one acquires a subtler eye for all philosophizing to date. As having gone through this experience, now I look at all the philosophers before me, and I kind of start to see certain things as symptomatic in their thinking. One is better than before at guessing the involuntary detours, alleyways, resting places, and sunning places of thought to which suffering thinkers are led and misled on account of their suffering. One now knows where the sick body and its needs unconsciously urge, push, and lure the mind towards sun, towards stillness, mildness, patience, medicine, balm in some sense. Right? So Nietzsche is saying here, we can see in certain philosophies certain moves, certain tendencies, certain features as symptomatic of an underlying lack of wellness. 
a bodily lack of wellness even. And he's saying that, that we can diagnose um, and we can start then trying to produce philosophies that don't suffer from that, um, that shortcoming, right? <clears throat> he says, every philosophy that ranks peace above war, every philosophy, every ethic with a negative definition of happiness, right? Happiness is avoiding X. Um, every metaphysics and physics that knows some finale, right? That has some idea of final state of some sort. Every predominantly aesthetic or religious craving for some apart, some beyond, some outside, some above, all of these permits the question whether it was not illness that inspired the philosopher. And so Nietzsche's not claiming, of course, it was illness that inspired the philosopher in every one of these cases. He's saying these seem symptomatic of a kind of suffering and weakness uh, in the individual that create them. The need for um, peace rather than war. Think about Heraclitus's idea of uh, polymos as the king of all and the father of all, that kind of thing. Um, right, and the, 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 any, any sense that uh, uh, we, a, a desire to arrive at a metaphysical understanding of the world where that condition uh, of the world is diagnosed at, or is, is understood as fixed set, that we are, we, we've arrived at a kind of stability. Nietzsche's seeing in all of these things a kind of need for some comfort, and the philosophizing is aimed at comforting oneself, right? Um, he says, right, the unconscious disguise of physiological needs under the cloaks of the objective ideal, purely spiritual, goes frighteningly far. I have asked myself often enough whether on a grand scale philosophy has been no more than an interpretation of the body and a misunderstanding of the body. That's kind of a fabulous description of philosophy, right? Um, <clears throat> then we just want to uh, note right, that his, his suggestion then in closing of this section, right, he says, well, um, I'm still waiting for a philosophical position in the exceptional sense of the term. Someone who has set himself the task of pursuing the problem of total health of a people, time, race, or humanity to summon the courage at least to push my suspicion to its limit and risk the proposition. What was at stake in philosophizing hitherto was not at all truth, but something else. Let's say health, future, growth, power, life. That is, philosophy presented itself and understood itself to be aim aiming at truth. And by that here, Nietzsche means a representation that accurately corresponds in, 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 in discourse or in the mind or in a theory, a, a representation that accurately um, uh, captures what is present in reality. And that accurate correspondence, uh, tr aiming at truth in that sense, Nietzsche saying that's what philosophy has always understood itself to be aiming at, and that was its criterion for success. That is, a philosophy is good if it arrives at that accurate, precise, and exhaustive representation of reality, of objective reality. And that would be the, 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 the ultimate goal of all philosophizing. And he's suggesting maybe not, maybe philosophy, even when it was just trying to comfort the, the, the philosopher, even when the, the philosopher was simply trying to, to comfort themselves, to convalesce through their philosophy, to give themselves something comforting and, 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 and safe and, and, and supportive uh, uh, and interpreting the world in those terms, or when the philosopher was trying to express this experience of the volatile, uh, constantly shifting, internally contradicting, meaningless uh, chaos of life, and was trying to express that by self-consciously creating concepts that, 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 that express rather than claim to capture or accurately represent reality, um, the re reality of nature, as Nietzsche thought the, the early pre-Platonic uh, philosophers had done. In both of those cases, what they're aiming at is not actually truth as accurate correspondence to reality. What they're really aiming at is health, at, at 
participating in health, or what Nietzsche sort of suggests is, are maybe somewhat synonymous with health here, future growth, power, life. Maybe that's what philosophy has always been aiming, has always been aiming at. It just sort of misunderstood itself all this time. Uh, okay, so let's look a little bit at the next, uh, where Nietzsche goes from here, right? He wants to, so in, uh, on page six and seven here, right? He wants to say precisely how um, philosophy sort of uh, relates to uh, this experience of convalescence, this, this is in what it derives from, how it, how it properly participates in and what it derives from um, uh, uh, life in, in the experience of convalescence. So he says here, right, uh, a philosopher who has passed through many kinds of health, which Nietzsche himself had in these sort of a rhythmic loss of health and return to health throughout a number of years, right, and keeps passing through them again and again, has passed through an equal number of philosophies. He simply cannot but translate his state every time into the most spiritual form and distance. And this is a great description of philosophy too, right? It's the misunderstanding of the body. It's also the art of transfiguration. This art of transfiguration just is philosophy. Translating that experience into uh, the most spiritual form and distance, that is concepts, right? Inventing concepts. He says, we philosophers are not free to separate soul from body as the common people do. We are even less free to separate soul from spirit. That's, I think, an amazing idea there, right? Um, and he says here, right, we are no thinking frogs objectifying and registering devices with frozen innards. He's just thinking of cold-bloodedness, right? We must constantly give birth to our thoughts out of our pain and maternally endow them with all that we have of blood, heart, fire, pleasure, passion, agony, conscience, fate, and disaster. And this is a great line here. Life to us, that means constantly transforming all that we are into light and flame. The light and flame of conceptual production, right? And also all that wounds us, all of that, right? We simply can do no other. So, this, uh, 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 I think, is a, a really powerful description of the philosophical project. And we're beginning to understand then how philosophy operates if it has abandoned that traditional notion of truth, right? It operates by self-consciously, knowingly, ideally, translating into concepts and conceptual relations sort of an echo of that bodily experience. And, and, and as here, here we have a positive uh, image of the figure of the of the feminine maternally sort of tending to that that those thoughts by giving them all of the content of that experience right feeding them uh, that, that that all of the content of that experience and that means everything pleasure and agony and everything in between right and he says here then um, uh, uh, only great pain that long, slow pain that takes its time and in which we are burned, as it were, over green wood, forces us philosophers to descend into our ultimate depths and put aside all trust. Every good-natured, veiling, mild, average, or sorry, everything good-natured, veiling, mild, average, things in which we formerly may have found our humanity. So things that we thought of ourselves as um, essentially, what make us essentially human, all of those things we set aside, right? We, we become impatient with those things um, in this extreme feeling of pain and digging down into our very depths. We go below that surface into the depths of what makes us what we are. Uh, and he says, I doubt that such pain makes us better, but I know it makes us deeper. So here we have Nietzsche's claim that, right, um, that real philosophy, the philosophy uh, in the, the highest form seems to require of us both health in order to produce um, philosophy out of our strengths and not philosophize out of our weaknesses to give ourselves comforts. Um, so it requires both health, but also sickness. And the proper 
moment for philosophizing is convalescence, returning to hell. Having been sick, having pushed down into the depths of what you are, um, having suffered, having gone through a difficult uh, experience, and out of that, philosophizing. That's the moment for philosophizing for Nietzsche. And otherwise, philosophy will remain a kind of superficiality, or worse, uh, self-deception. Um, okay, so I want to read this one last quote for you here. Um, from uh, describing this experience, he says, one emerges from such dangerous exercises in self-mastery as a different person with a few more question marks. This is really a wonderful thing, right? Uh, above all, with the will henceforth to question further. So this is a, a, a classic Nietzschean move. He's, he's telling you, you get to know yourself better when you undergo this suffering, the kind of suffering we're doing now that, that, that pushes you into your depths and, and causes you to, to, to be exposed to, to what's far beneath the surface uh, of your conscious experience most of the time. And you start feeling that, you're exposed to that. And he says, you get to know yourself better. And what, what, is, what form does that knowledge take? A question mark. You, you become aware of an essential, constitutive, and internal uh, question-worthiness within you. And that's what you get to know. It's not that by getting sick, you tear open the, your, your, yourself and you dig down, you find the core of what you are, and then you could express that in these three propositions. I guess what I really am is X, Y, and Z, and now I know that, and now I can you know, philosophize out of that. No, when you dig down into the depths and, are, and, and finally incorporate them, what they are is questioning. They're, 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 they're the question worthy itself, and out of that, you philosophize. So he says, right? Um, a will to question further and to question more deeply, severely, harshly, evilly, and quietly than one had previously questioned. These are some hard, hard words, right? We're going to question severely. We're going to question harshly and even evilly. And what Nietzsche means here is because you're going to be questioning in this intensely critical way and going and, and exposing all of these ideals and idols uh, to their, 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 their messy grounds in your philosophical scrutinizing, that's gonna be perceived as evil because you're gonna be calling into question all of the, 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 the sacred cows that people hold on to and they give them comfort. And that's gonna be perceived as evil. But it's in the interests of provoking life to surge back into itself and produce more creatively, more energetically. And that's the, the ultimate aim uh, in, in, for Nietzsche, right? And he says, what's fascinating here is, in this experience, what happens is the trust in life is gone. Life itself has become a problem, right? Yet one should not jump to the conclusion that this necessarily makes one sullen, right? So your trust in life is gone. You don't think, oh, everything will work out in the end, or life is always for the good, or anything along those lines. Rather, what you think is that life is a question mark. I have to confront that. I have to confront the, the internal essential questionworthiness of the fact of life and the, the, the event of life. And I have to take on board that that's a question it's not necessarily good. And now once I've incorporated that, then I begin to think about everything else, right? He says, right, even love, uh, even love of life is still possible. Only one loves differently. It is like the love for a woman who gives us doubts, right? So here we have one of these moments that we've already talked about in, um, especially with respect to Irigaray's reading of Nietzsche and um, Derrida's Spurs, where we have a a kind of an invocation of the, the image of the feminine or the image of the, the figure of woman um, with one of its sort of traditional associations, right? The, 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 the woman as potentially um, uh, unfaithful, uh, but as a, 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 an object of passionate love. And we have to wonder about the status of that. That is, it's clear that 
for Nietzsche, he's utilizing a, 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 a traditional trope, a traditional uh, association with the feminine, but does he succeed in sort of taking that up, exposing it as problematic, and then utilizing it, or does he just simply participate in it? And I think what we saw both Arigurai and Derrida coming down on the side of there being a fundamental ambivalence in the Nietzschean text that we have to sort of accept. We want to attend to that ourselves as we read lines like this. And throughout the gay science, there's some more problematic stuff in there about the figure of woman. Okay, so now let's go to uh, section four here. Let's just start at the very, very, right, very end here. So what he says here, then about a kind of Uh, a kind of relationship to truth is, I think, really, really fascinating. So right, at the beginning of section four here, he says, right, so what, right, what, are the, what do convalescents need then? Do they, do they need a kind of supportive, almost sort of, it seems, a kind of romantic art to, to help them, you know, uh, uh, support them in their, in their work? And he says, no, no. What, what we need, and this is an, an interesting moment where it seems like his philosophizing now is sort of being compared to, to a, a, a kind of art, but he says, if we convalescents still need art, it is another kind of art, a mocking, light, fleeting, divinely untroubled, divinely artificial art, like a bright flame blazes into an unclouded sky. Above all, and this is really important to try to think through what this means, an art for artists, only for artists. In addition, we will know better what is and foremost needed for that kind of our cheerfulness. Any cheerfulness, my friends. So this is a, a really important point, right? That, that this art, if philosophy becomes a kind of, takes on this creative mode of reflecting, up, of reflecting upon, immersing itself in and then reflecting upon painful experience, experience that drives us down into our depths and out of which we create then philosophical concepts. The kind of artistic creation that's involved in that is an art for artists. That is, we create our philosophical concepts no longer to sort of finally and completely capture the nature of reality in concepts and freeze it, freeze reality there a kind of final word. I've completely mapped all the conceptual relations that are present in reality and I say them now to you and now we can give up philosophizing. The idea would be that, no, no, in this mode, as an art for artists, you create your philosophical concepts in order for someone, in order to facilitate someone else's creating their philosophical concepts. You don't have, your concepts aren't imposed on someone as a, passive receiver, they're given to someone as active creator. And that's a really interesting thing to try to figure out, well, what kinds of, how do we articulate our concepts for that? How do we start to think our concepts and what kind of concepts should we generate in order to facilitate that? It's a very bold thought, I think, and a, and a profound one and, and not, not an easy one to think, but there's got to be a crucial difference in the kind of concepts we create and, and the way we articulate those concepts. I mean, one answer to this question would be Nietzsche's modeling it for us. Nietzsche's trying to do precisely that. That much is clear. Okay, so now just this last little bit on uh, a kind of truth or a relationship to truth that we have here uh, in this creative notion of philosophy. Right? If we've abandoned that idea of truth as the accurate representation of a present reality, correspondence theory of truth. If we've abandoned that, then what are we, what are we aiming at? Well, it's interesting. Nietzsche wants to say, well, we still aim at truth, but it's a very different kind of truth, a very challenging one, right? He says, um, right, we have grown sick of this bad taste, this will to truth, to truth at any price, this youthful madness in the love of truth. We are too experienced, too serious, too jovial, too burned, too deep for that. We no longer believe that truth remains truth when one pulls off the veil. 
we have lived too much to believe this. Today, we consider it a matter of decency not to wish to see everything naked. And there's this story about this uh, a little girl asking her mother, is God everywhere? And, and, uh, and, and then saying, well, that seems really indecent. God is looming in at every, every moment in human life. Right? Um, he says, there's a hint for philosophers in that, that instinct. Well, why, why would God want to be there with me in the bathroom? Why do, you know, that, that seems kind of suspicious. Um, and so he's saying that's, that, that, that's something for philosophers to, 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 to take a kind of um, uh, a directive from, right? Oh, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe omnipotent, or sorry, om, om, omniscience, knowing everything, is not some aim or ideal uh, that we should have as philosophers, possibly, right? Um, and he says here, right, one should have more respect for the bashfulness with which nature has hidden behind riddles and iridescent uncertainties. Here's another uh, invocation of this well, fundamental one for Nietzsche. Perhaps truth is a woman who has grounds for not showing her grounds. Perhaps her name is, to speak theory, Baubo. There's a story about Baubo down here that you can read down uh, from Plutarch, but anyway. Uh, or no, sorry, story about Baubo and, and her uh, trying to make. Um, Right, uh, Demeter laugh when uh, Persephone was uh, um, uh, abducted by Hades. So, um, what you can, what I think is really fascinating here is this idea that Nietzsche is suggesting maybe we need to think of philosophy as aiming at a kind of truth which is not an exhaustive unveiling of things. Maybe that. Not, not that that's sort of immoral or that it's to be avoided because it's disrespectful or something like that, that you could take that passage in that direction, but that's not what Nietzsche means. He means when you exhaustively reveal things, you actually lose the truth about them. Understanding them truthfully involves bringing them to light, revealing them, that is creating concepts that reflect reality, but allowing the ground out of which those concepts arise to remain mysterious, to remain ultimately beyond the power of conceptualization. That would be a kind of proper truth for this artistic mode of philosophizing. Truly, Philosophizing about reality is expressing that experience in concepts, your experience of the world in concepts, in such a way that those concepts point down to their grounds and say, that is not captured by these concepts. These concepts have a limit as to what they're capable of communicating, uh, what they reflect about reality. And what's beneath that limit, what's further down in those grounds, is actually to be non-conceptualized. It's beyond uh, language, beyond uh, uh, concepts, and we need to sort of philosophically play with that boundary. We want to be at that boundary, conceptualizing uh, even as we point to a ground that can't ultimately be conceptualized, and that's the task of this philosophy. Um, just as the last kind of note here, right, Nietzsche then connects us back to the Greeks and to the, the, the Greek um, respect for and love of the Dionysian, right? He says here, oh, those Greeks, they knew how to live. What is needed uh, for that is to stop bravely at the surface, the fold, the skin, to worship appearance, to believe in shapes, tones, words, in the whole Olympus of appearance, right? The world as an Olympus of appearance, right? The, those Greeks were superficial, out of profundity, and is not this precisely what we are coming back to, we daredevils of the spirit who have climbed the highest and most dangerous peak of current thought and looked around from up here, looked down from up there? Are we not just in this respect Greeks, worshippers of shapes, tones, and words, and therefore artists, right? So here we have uh, Nietzsche in, invoking this idea of um, right, philosophizing as artistic, as creative, and saying that's precisely what the Greeks were doing in their tragedy, but also in their philosophy in their respect for the Dionysian, they were marking a limit uh, to what they could clearly articulate, what they could capture in concepts. And they were marking that limit and staying at the surface of those appearances knowingly, 
right, self-consciously. Um, and he's saying, that's what we have to do today. But just one last uh, uh, um, uh, point to be made here, uh, that there is an aspect of, the, of this uh, that could be misunderstand, misunderstood, right? This idea that we, we need to return to the Greeks, that the Greeks uh, were these you know, perfect geniuses and that we should uh, simply uh, kind of revert back to a Greek uh, uh, understanding of the world. That's, that, would be a, that would be a terrible misunderstanding of, of, of Nietzsche's point here. Um, so let's go to page uh, 194 up here, I think. Is that what page on there? 39, 39, no. Okay, so that's, uh, let's say one, um, one, let's see, 208. No, okay, so we'll try a little bit further, 230. 344. Okay, yeah, great. All right, so let's go back up just a little bit. Just want to show you this little bit here. So this is right before 341, where Nietzsche introduces the heaviest weight, um, which is that the thought of the eternal recurrence of the same. And Nietzsche introduces then this kind of uh, this moment in Socrates where he asks for a, um, a, a sacrifice to be made to the god Asclepius, the god of medicine uh, uh, after his um, execution, seeming to indicate that he was asking for a cure uh, to life. And then he kind of, um, you know, he says, uh, uh, um, well, did Socrates really suffer from life? Was he not this kind of strong philosopher philosophizing from his strengths, but actually philosophizing from his weaknesses? Is that true? And then he says here, this final word, oh, friends, we must overcome the Greeks. Um, and so what we want to realize here is that Nietzsche is calling us in that earlier um, last paragraph of the preface, he's calling us not to do what the Greeks did, but to do as the Greeks did. That is, they saw the chaos and the meaninglessness and the, the unintelligibility of the world around them. They didn't deny it or pretend it wasn't there or invent an alternative perception of the world or conception of the world that, that, that overcame that. They took that into themselves. They embodied that insight. And out of that, they created a world of concepts. That's tragic philosophizing or Dionysian philosophizing. Even. Um, and that's what Nietzsche sees the Greeks as having done. And that's what we have to do today. Not return to the Greeks, but now in our current cultural condition and situation to do as they did. And that's what he's really challenging us to do. That would be to return to health and to philosophize from health. So what I would now just uh, uh, suggest that uh, you do is to look at specifically um, these sections, uh, uh, these aphorisms, the consciousness of appearance, um, to the teachers of the purpose of existence, that's the very first aphorism. Consciousness of appearance, the madman, where Nietzsche introduces the death of God, and the greatest weight, where he introduces the, um, the thought of the eternal recurrence of the same. And I would try to think of these, uh, uh, to try to think of these uh, uh, specifically as um, how they were asking yourself how they relate to a uh, uh, undertaking this philosophy of health. That is, right, how Nietzsche's radicalized notion of appearance as being itself, that is, appearance not as opposed to being, but as being itself, as, as, as the unfolding of being, how that, uh, and second, how his madman's declaration of the death of God, and third, how his experience of eternal return of the same all work together in the practice of philosophizing from hell? That's the question that we have to ask as we move through the gay signs. Okay, everyone. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for listening, and uh, hang in there.